Let's get the show on the road. Thanks everybody so much for coming. Um, it was so exciting to watch the registrations pour in today as uh, word of this uh, session got out. And uh, this is our sixth North American Virtual Miro User Group or VMUG for short. So I wanted to first give a big um, thank you to, to two folks, to, to Brittany Koshera and to Natalie Lurino who are heading up the community element of Miro. Um, Natalie, who's my cohort for today is the community events coordinator. Um, we both have a really strong desire to grow and connect and learn from the community. And in a relatively short time since we've connected, I can already tell she's the right person for this job. Um, she has been with Miro for a short time, but is a seasoned Miro user and um, we've just been getting along swimmingly. So that's been absolutely great. Say hi, Natalie. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Thank you so much for people coming from all ends of the earth, from Europe, you know, in the middle of the night. We really, really appreciate it. And we're super excited to, to get to know all of you um, and have a fun event. So thank you. That's great. So I'm Jonathan White. I'm a management consultant in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and my company is called Improve Consulting Group. Um, we focus on operational excellence and Miro is a tool I've been using for two years now. Um, and it's just phenomenal in how it facilitates good collaboration, good teamwork, creates a one-stop shop for all of my client work and deliverables. Um, it can be used to, to do process mapping, organizational charts. It gets everyone on the same page, everyone contributing uh, and figuring out where efficiencies can be gained in their organizations. Um, I also have a new venture called Distributed Success, uh, where I have a team of collaborators I'm working with looking to help companies to weather this COVID-19 storm that we find ourselves in and also prepare for the future to um, maybe more permanently or, or um, to a higher degree integrate some remote work into their businesses because there are a lot of benefits that come from it and certainly this tool Miro makes life a lot easier when you're collabor collaborating remotely with folks. Um, even with the crisis that we find ourselves in today, um, there's been some amazing news that's come from Miro, and I don't know if, if everyone saw this, but um, just relieved some additional investment of about $50 million, which means that a lot of more people are using Miro. We just uh, surpassed 5 million users. So that's all fantastic news. There's no indication that this is going to slow down. And um, if the tool didn't work, then it wouldn't be growing like hotcakes. And it is indeed growing really well because it does work. Um, very, very well. So more and more people are discovering this amazing tool. We want to turn this wave of, of new users into more success, not just for Miro though. It's really huge and really important to us that we grow this community because um, when people ask me how I use the tool, I can tell them a few things, but really I'm only limited by my imagination and how I get things done. So with that in mind, we hope all your families are doing safe and healthy right now. We hope your work lives get just a little bit better, more productive, more collaborative by connecting through this event, um, the events we're going to have in the future, and all the activity that we're going to hope to see on the community site. Um, if I am ever lacking an inspiration for what I'm working on in Miro, uh, I don't need to look any further than, than, than my colleagues and collaborators who use the tool, uh, the platform, uh, the community. I can always go in there. If I, if I can't see that someone's done something I'm interested in doing, asking questions gets a response usually within a couple of hours. Um, and then we have this great connection of uh, Miro pioneers and ambassadors and community coordinators that can all be tapped into for their knowledge. And I'm really pleased that um, from the efforts uh, in working with Miro over the past two years, it's come to fruition um, for myself to be named the first uh, virtual user group leader. Um, and part of what Natalie is going to talk to today is, is how we want to see that grow and expand and get more leaders involved, which can mean more events. Um, and whether those events are focused in a specific area of business um, that you can learn from. So user experience design, uh, brainstorming ideation, modeling, storyboarding, product and service design, They're, the topics are literally endless. So you might find something there that's really interesting to you or just seeing how people use Miro. So no matter what you're planning on using it for, get ready to learn about a lot more. And uh, I think we can really get a lot of things done in local and in distributed teams using Miro. We do have kind of an icebreaker here for those who want to get a bit interactive with the session. And uh, for sure, what you're seeing on my screen and hopefully seeing on your own screens too is, is absolutely my favorite part of Miro. Even fav more favorite than that undo button is seeing 
everybody up here on the screen contributing, doing something, moving things around. So we have this icebreaker here where you can just kind of introduce yourself, have a, a blue sticky up here, just, you know, your name, what you do, what does community mean to you and anything else you want to include, like your Twitter handle, your LinkedIn page, your website. Um, and we can all reflect back on these later and uh, hopefully make some new connections with each other because that's what this is all about is building a great community. Okay, so the Miro community is what we're here to talk about today. So some of the first things we wanted to cover is why would you join and contribute to the Miro community? Um, number one, it's to connect you with other professionals, um, local community of pioneers and ambassadors that are being set up in Miro. There are people who have been using this tool for a long time, learning the ins and outs, learning all the new features as they're released. It's a great opportunity to get connected there. Um, you can empower yourself uh, and others through the knowledge that you have on trends related to distributed and collaborative work. There's always new stuff coming out. Miro is partnering and holding many different events, uh, webinars, uh, lots of opportunities to learn and, uh, and personally grow. And then you wanna gain perspective from community, from community members as well. Um, how are you gonna maximize the work that you can do and get the most out of your Miro experience? So I, I love it because all everybody's welcome to use it. Um, you get industry professionals, you have students, casual users, seasoned veterans, people who just want to get things done. Miro can really enhance the effectiveness of working in teams. And I use it a lot just on my own because it's such a nice visual tool to use. Um, so these are some reasons why we think it's, it's a good idea to join the Miro community. So, boom. Um, I think one of the, the big reasons that I've become involved with Miro is because I have a lot of passion for it. It didn't take long for me to realize the potential in it. I believe it's completely transformed the way I, I conceptualize and deliver the work that I do um, because I no longer have to be the, the face at the front of the room holding a, a sticky note and a, and a pen and writing everything and putting up on the walls and people on their phones waiting for their turn to speak. Now everybody gets involved at the same time. So I just wanted to get across that there's a lot of passion that, that we can bring to the table. I think there's also a lot of, um, uh, of community spirit that we can bring. Um, I actually love this little boat picture up top the most because I love to surround myself with people who are smarter than me. Um, they know more so then I can learn from them and I can grow. And as a community, we can do so much more together than if we're just all working independently. We won't learn from each other as well. We won't learn the, the tips and the tricks and, and see what works best. And as a community, we also can influence Miro, the organization, to deliver what we need. Um, and I wonder at times if Miro realizes the full potential of the tool because I still can't wrap my head around all the different ways to use it. So they'll just keep building the platform and as we need functions, as we need um, new look and feel as we need new tools templates we can request it and the community will provide or Miro will provide and that's been that's been really great so far so the Miro community itself is where I wanted to start and um, a little later on we'll have a, a little uh, area for you guys to reflect on if you're a member or not but about 13, 1300 users so far. And the core of the community is broken up into three main sections. There's discussions, questions, and community stories. And these are all great for getting some inspiration or getting your, your questions answered, your troubles solved. Um, and there's been so many good examples of this. I wanted to run through a few of them with you today. So number one was, um, here's how a Miro article can drive good discussion and get people the teaching and learning that they want. So Lena um, posted up a quick how-to article of how they're using um, blog posts, videos, and frameworks within Miro. And so what that ended up looking like, um, that someone wanted to um, take the, the templates and the framework that was created uh, and, and improve on it and take it for themselves. So people started asking questions. How do you effectively run meetings with participants? Is there a chance to break them into smaller groups to talk? And the response that came back from, from Michael here is one of the top users in the Miro community started showing some examples that he's done of how he took a group of 25 users and divided them up into 25 groups, which gave this user the answer that they needed. So, um, there was some additional stuff with, you know, how can you link to frames? And this gets back to the, um, the linking tool that I was talking about earlier. So a real simple example here um, gets thrown in and the user gets their question answered. Um, the next way to do it is you can use questions to drive your learning in Miro. 
And so someone had a question here about, you know, they use SurveyMonkey and Typeform, but how can you kind of do a survey uh, using Miro? Is there a voting app the best way to go or are there any other ways? And, you know, the voting app works really well, but it can be a little bit daunting for brand new users. So the uh, the other way to go, and this is from one of our attendees tonight from Kieran, um, talks about using a dot uh, sorting technique or a dot voting technique um, or prune the product tree, which I love that saying. So Carrie, who is the uh, asker of this question, um, asked him if there was any kind of tool or special template to be used. And um, I believe the response was that it's, you know, let's just get some dots on the page and make sure that there are the layer above. And here's how you can add the dots into the board to, to have uh, users vote for their, their top priority areas. And this solved that user's issue. So just a, a simple thing, Kieran grabbing this information from his board, pasting it in a picture, and, and now this user, Carrie, can move on with her project and, and uh, get it completed. And then another one of our guests tonight, uh, Martina, um, took a lot of time to share with us some of the way that she is setting up her boards to, to support trainers um, and developers and marketing experts. So there's a lot of educational material in the information presented here. Um, and so it was broken up into actually five different examples, um, the full setup of the Train the Trainer course. Um, I highly recommend you guys go in and check out this post because this is so creative and amazing. Um, it's kind of actually breathtaking. The second example that was shared was how materials get implemented. The third example was how workshops are set up. And, and I believe that she was running remote workshops on the same board so that the information could be synthesized and grouped easier later on, which enables people to see the work that was done, how it all comes together. And um, it's kind of a great way to present a lot of information in a short space. Um, how the brainstorming sessions were organized and run and then I think there was only four, sorry, I said there was five, but there was four. And then you just get the thanks pouring out from the board. Um, everyone's getting inspired, everyone is learning things. Um, this is the kind of stuff that gives me the warm and fuzzies when I see it in the community. And I think after I read this post, I spent the next week pretty much coming in every day, logging in and trying to answer as many questions as I could so I could live up to Martina's example. We should do is go in through the community and get some posts in here and get some dialogue driven with Martina so she can she can share some of the background and the successes that uh, that she's realized here. So the other half of um, what's going on in Miro besides the communities are, are these events and so um, these are wonderful interactive learning sessions that um, allow us to come together and, and show some real live examples of how people are using Miro um, and and what kind of disciplines and industries they're applying it to. So it's always fascinating every time to see the differences in, uh, in the approach. We've, on number six, you can see the listing of the five we have here. Miro has a, a YouTube channel where a lot of their, um, all of the user group videos get posted, both the North American and the European, but there are a lot of other educational videos and uh, um, just lots of great content that folks can get into. So, in running the um, the user groups that we've had so far, we've learned a few things. It's always nice to get some some knowledge from these events. And number one is that the applications for Miro are are virtually endless. Um, you know, if you're going to come up with a really specific use, there are going to be a lot of tools that you can that you can use. But um, Miro seems to fit the bill for so many things. Um, I'm having a hard time finding out situations where it's not applicable. Um, Miro appeals both to left and right brain individuals. So you get your analytic folks versus your creative. There's something for everybody in Miro. So that just promotes it as a good collaboration tool. Um, the library of templates, integrations, and functions are constantly growing. Um, and you can make your own templates. If you are working in a board, you get some cool stuff going. You get a cool brainstorming panel that you want to save for yourself that has all the stickies built in. It's as easy as selecting it, say, save to a template, and you're good to go. Um, and it feels like every time I log into the system, it's, it's got a welcome page that says, here's some new stuff, here's some new stuff. And I go into the templates page and then there's more new things. It's amazing. Um, and and the, the beauty part about it is you can pull a template off, but you don't have to use the template as it sits. It's all editable. So you can change titles. You can rearrange the boxes. You can say, I have a tool in my mind that I normally use it's slightly different, but kind of similar, then pull the similar tool down and then modify it for your own and save it as your own template. Um, getting your own company's branded colors and things like that is very easy to do.
Um, the experience level um, of attendees in the user groups uh, is actually ranges from novice beginners up to experts. And this was really surprising when I first joined the community. I thought it was going to be an influx of really seasoned, experienced users um, that we could learn from. And it's been an, a great mix. Uh, and I think because we find ourselves working from home and people are looking for these productivity tools more and more, we're going to see more attendees in these sessions. We're going to um, see more range in the user groups and it's really important for the community to get in there and support the beginners so that they can get using the tool find some new applications get better than us and then we can turn around and learn back from them uh, after five events we've done a lot of retrospectives um, and so that you know a majority of attendees when we do our retrospectives relate that they uh, have learned something new and that they can apply it in their day-to-day -day work. So these events are very useful. Uh, it's only an hour of time. It's free, which is always great. And um, your coffee's as good as you make it at home. And then there are a lot of experts and influencers who are willing to share their, their challenges and their stories of success. And that's one of the, the biggest positives I can take away from the community is um, if I'm having problems, I know where to turn. I can just go no further than the community. Um, I, I always know where Natalie and Brittany are so I can and hit them up for information when I need. It, it's just the way that Miro is rolling with this. They, they want to be available, they want to help, um, and it's a breath of fresh air for, for most application companies and platform companies that I've, that I've been exposed to. So with all that kind of summary of what we've seen and, 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 and where we are now, it's kind of some of the discussion we wanted to have today was to get your feedback on, on where do we go from here. And this is particularly exciting because we get to decide as the community. Um, and I believe that Miro will support us however they can to get there. And that's just a fantastic opportunity. Um, and so wherever we want to go, we'll go. And, that's because Captain, Captain Jack Sparrow says so. So this has got to be the best community I've ever seen. Um, and I'll turn it over to Natalie now, who can take you through a bit of, um, of how we arrived to where we are with the community right cool. now. Thank you, John. Perfect. OK, so community management. So I'll give a brief overview on just generally like how we're approaching community management at Miro. Um, I know it may not seem like it, but Miro is still a startup, even though we're obviously succeeding and doing so great for ourselves. Um, we're still a startup, so we really are taking a grassroots approach to how we're building our community. Um, and that's why all of your feedback and doing these events and promoting our user stories are so pivotal at this time, especially. So in short, Community management is basically how a brand uses opportunities to interact with our audience, to create a network and, you know, fostering how we can connect and share and grow together. Um, it's important because this is what happens beyond social media publishing. It encompasses so many different facets of what makes a company successful because it encompasses customer service, it encompasses customer support and all of these things and marketing especially. Um, so kind of being, you know, being able to spearhead these discussions is really important to us. And I kind of broke down some of the ways that we're doing so through monitoring, listening in on conversations that we're having on the forum and conversations that we're having internal while we're putting on these events, engaging, keeping conversations alive and being proactive in how we're engaging with their users. Moderating, you know, going into the forum and seeing what are the discussions, how can we approach them and kind of answer questions and troubleshoot as we go. And then measuring, which I'll talk about um, in a few upcoming slides, you know, how are we analyzing how our brand is being perceived, um, you know, and getting real unfiltered feedback. So our mission, our tentative mission right now is bringing our users together to share, empower, and create the next big thing. And the next big thing is co-opted from Miro's actual slogan, um, which is, you know, creating the next best thing. Um, so we're really excited moving forward and kind of pivoting towards really, you know, giving a voice to the community as we're growing it. So I'll show these in a few slides, but we're kind of going through process of development right now. So first being identifying the value, building the structure, creating organizing resources, mapping out our process and strategy, optimizing for scale, and then our future roadmap strategy when we get to post scale. So I have a few slides of screenshots of the boards that me and Brittany have created um, internally on how we can kind of map out this new endeavor, which is the Miro community and as we're scaling it. 
So the first phase, um, and as, as John had mentioned, I'm fairly new, I just started in March. So me and Brittany have been really, you know, as soon as I started, we dove right in identifying the value. And this is pivotal for a new community endeavor because, you know, how do we get internal buy-in? How do we get external buy-in from our users? Like, why should they care about our community? So the first thing that we did was that we created a couple of wireframes and we're kind of just using a simple exercise using post-its to kind of identifying, you know, what are our value propositions for our users? Second, building the structure. So this was really important. This was the next step for us, identifying what are the roles that we have within, you know, especially pertaining to events. Right now, obviously, we're kind of cap capsized by just doing, you know, virtual events. So, you know, how do we carve out those roles um, for virtual events? Then we created a calendar, and this is still in beta, but there will eventually be a way for everyone to add calendars to their mirror boards. And this is great, especially for tracking social media postings and events and syncs and all these things. Um, so it's really exciting. And then event types, you know, right now we have a few that we've laid out, but as we keep growing and we're getting, you know, feedback and interest from our user leaders and speakers and, you know, participants, we're going to grow our event types eventually. Um, and then phase three, create and organize resources. So we have so many different resources that we've created. It's a living, all of these are living documents as we continue to scale. But right now, organizing all of our resources and putting them in one place is really important for Brittany and I to kind of help ground ourselves and ground our user leaders, especially as we're onboarding new ones. And then this is my favorite <laughs> diagram that I've made so far in Miro. Um, and it's basically mapping out our current process and our current strategy. So right now, as we're finding new speakers, we're going through um, different phases on onboarding them. We have uh, templates mapped out already. Basically, every part of the funnel, we're trying to really hone in and kind of develop as we're moving forward. And so far, this is what we've kind of created now. Um, and eventually, what our aim is to do is, as we're finding speakers and doing events, we want to try um, our eventual goal is to convert some of those speakers into becoming user leaders. Um, so that's our kind of wide, you know, or wider uh, process as we're moving forward. So this is really exciting. This is definitely my favorite board that I've created thus far. And then phase five, you know, optimizing for scale. So as we're getting new leaders and getting new speakers, you know, how can we continue fostering that as we grow to scale? Because eventually we're going to have, you know, 50 cities launched and we're going to have so many events going on. So we want to be able to kind of carve out that foundation for that now, especially as we eventually go into in-person, you know, in the next year or so, or whenever quarantine ends. And then phase six, the last phase is a roadmap strategy. So finding leaders post scale. So at this time, you know, we're thinking about onboarding. What would that look like after we've gotten to scale and people, you know, they know about our program already. They know about our community. We have a huge community. We want to be able to kind of facilitate, you know, applications and a whole onboarding process is different than what we're doing currently. Because currently what we're doing is mostly cold outreach. We're finding engaged users who may be interested and we're kind of capitalizing on, on those um, relationships. But in the future, as we get to scale, you know, we'll have a wider audience that's aware of our program and wants to be engaged users and kind of showcase, you know, their own experience using Miro. So going into more of, you know, a theoretical framework of how we're approaching community management, I took from the space model, which uh, GitHub developed, um, and it basically just kind of encapsulates how you know, community management, it's so integral to a company and especially to a startup because, you know, especially with Miro, we're obviously so customer facing. There's so many different use cases for our products. Organically, we've already seen, you know, relationships being formed between users and between companies that are using our products. So we want to be able to, you know, continue strengthening that to the best of our ability. So this model kind of just showcases every aspect of like our, our stakeholders and kind of how important that the community management you know, program is. Um, and the last one that I definitely want to talk about is the internal engagement piece to this, because that's one thing that I think a lot of community programs may you know, find a pain point in is having that internal buy-in from other teams because you know, with community, it's a little bit harder to facilitate that internal buy-in from other, you know, from marketing and from tech and, you know, having all these resources. So that's super important for us um, to kind of continue carving out as we're, you know, growing. Um, and then other takeaways, 
Usually. Emmy and Brittany and all of our user leaders have been kind of understanding and kind of carving out now is identifying our audience needs. What do our users find valuable? So we find that through the community forum. We find that through our participation in certain events. You know, what topics are people interested in? What speakers are we getting in that want to speak at an event? You know, what are the trends that we're finding so far? Um, being able to post regularly, engage with our users, sharing our user stories, that's so incredibly important to building community. It's giving you know, a more tangible voice to user stories. And that's why these events are so amazing is because we're allowing that and we're giving amazing users that platform to share their experience and to share their own personal brands as well. Setting goals and objectives. So Mira, our, our community team has created a huddle board where we're giving um, you know, more access and more visibility to other teams to see how important our work is, how it can help them, identifying you know, our regular collaborators, um, because we work with so many different teams and we want to continue fostering those internal relationships and then determining KPIs. So right now, since we're still in our early days, we don't have so many data points, you know, to be able to track metrics in that way. But, you know, eventually to, when we get to scale, we will have those. We'll be able to use SQL and, you know, um, dive into metrics and all these things. So right now we're kind of understanding, you know, what may be our KPIs. Um, and I added two links to this board um, if you guys are interested in kind of learning more about, you know, what are the new kind of KPIs that community manager, managers are interested in and how can we measure our share of voice between other communities and other tech companies. And then lastly, best practices that I've kind of come up with um, to set the precedent for what our community team is aiming to do. So one being setting rules and guidelines. This is so important. We want to create an inclusive and diverse space with their user leaders, with their audience, with their events in general, because so many use cases, obviously everyone, I mean, we have so many people from around the world using our product, coming to our events. We want to create a really safe space for everyone to feel included and to have their voice heard. Um, checking in with their community regularly, checking in with our forum, checking in with people who've come to our events and doing retrospectives with users and, and new users especially to kind of see what they're interested in and how we can help create better connections between users. Advocate for authenticity. This is so important. You know, it, it, creating organic trust building is I think the most beautiful part of community that I feel is feel comes off as more ge genuine than perhaps, you know, marketing etc because community is already being organically formed if someone loves your products if you have a group of people who love your products automatically those relationships are kind of being formed between users and we see that in your forum especially showing appreciation you know honing in on user stories giving a platform to users to speak about what they're interested in about their own personal brands especially um, maintaining their brand's voice obviously keeping in line with marketing and our brand teams and then Lastly, just exploring new ways to engage our community. So as we're growing, nothing is set in stone. We still have a lot of room to, to grow and to learn what people are interested in and how we can best um, foster those relationships that we're forming now. So that's my spiel. Um, but overall, like we're very excited um, with everything that's happening right now. And, and yeah. So John, do you want to take it away? Yay, John and Natalie. I'm so <laughs> proud of you both. Oh, thank you. Oh, Brittany. <laughs> um, I think this is a really great example of, of, of community and what we're trying to set up, how we got here. Um, we have a couple of questions on the board. We're going to start going through, and I have an inkling that there are some users in this space here who might be able to help out with a couple of answers too. So um, as long as we're not getting too cluttered on the audio channel, like feel free to jump in uh, to build on any of the responses that Natalie and I are going to try and lead us through here. Um, will the video chat have expanded meeting and workshop functions in the future? This is a technical question that I as a super user might not know as much about. I wonder if Natalie and Brittany have any information on the future for um, uh, video chats. You can see on my bottom toolbar here, th these are some of the tools built in. There is a built-in video chat and screen sharing function, um, which is very useful. Uh, in my experience, people tend to rely on Zoom or GoToMeeting uh, as the video function and use Miro for um, for the collaboration element, but I leave it to the experts at Miro to kind of field that question. Yeah, so I can, can, yeah, see. go oh. on, Natalie. <laughs> no, no, it's all you, girl. <laughs> I was like, all I can say is yes, 
and things are happening very soon. Like John mentioned at the beginning, Mural is constantly like new features, new updates, and it's happening so fast that even internally at Miro, I'm still having to check out like the what's new because yeah, they're just every day. So yes, it's coming fast. <laughs> yes. And, Very good. And with our video chat functionality, um, they're currently developing new capabilities for it. Um, I'm not sure if they've announced it yet to the public, so I won't go into too, too, too much detail, but it's getting way better. <laughs> Don't worry, it's coming, it's not already. Um, so we're very excited for that, for sure. Very good. Um, next question I have here, uh, what is the best way to capture action items in Miro? Okay, so if I understand this question right, um, one of the ways that you can kind of, is, is this, maybe whoever wrote this can clarify, is this um, maybe you wanna assign tasks to folks and have them complete it? Yeah, this is, so this is Mike Owen. So that was my question. So as we do um, process mapping or other brainstorming workshops, we typically seem to end up with both action items, um, decisions made or agreements, and then usually a parking lot of some sort. Sure. So it's the best way to organize those things. I've tried using um, comments because they all summarize. Uh, on one side, I've tried using cards. Both of those are there's a little bit of cost to using those, but um, at least they seem to roll up in an easy way that you can just go down the list at the end of the event or the workshop and say, okay, we answered that, we answered that, we answered that. So I'm just wondering what people have found is the best and most effective way to capture those action items as you go. Sure. All over the board. Yeah, um, you, you've tried cards. Have you tried the Kanban board? Um, so I on the... I have not yet, so. Okay, so on the left menu at the very bottom for me, you actually might need to add it. If you click at the three dots at the bottom of the left-hand okay. menu, you can add more apps. Um, but I think the Kanban is built in permanently mm -hmm. right now. Uh, anyway, so if I pull over a Kanban, it's gonna be really small probably. How small? Where did it go? Come here, here we go. So uh, as in any simple Kanban, if you've ever used a uh, Trello or a simple tool, it's really a list for to do in progress and done. And this incorporates cards into it as well. So on card number one here, we can write task one, and then we can add a new card, make it task two. So for any card that you create, um, clicking in the top right corner expands it. So now we can write more details. You can create a tag for it, so important create the tag, it actually pops up visibly on the card for whatever color that you set. You can assign the task to Natalie, and we can say our due date for this one's gonna be tomorrow. Haha, -ha, no time for you, Natalie, get working. <laughs> um, then your team would simply monitor results. As in any good Kanban board, you can drag the tiles over so that you can see what's in your hopper, what's in progress, and then what's been completed. So Kanban's a good way to do it. Um, Miro does integrate with Trello as well. So if you started to assign tasks, um, and you made some changes uh, in your Trello board or on your Miro board, the, the kind of two-way communication kicks in so your team can update tasks and, uh, and action items. Uh, maybe I can suggest, Jonathan, the, uh, the other option that I've used is uh, the notes uh, capability. So at the top right, uh, um, that does provide a great way to annotate workshops and meetings as you're going. Um, you can use sort of a little checkbox icon uh, or have created like a checklist. And then that way it's really easy. It's a lot more informal than having a work board like the Kanban board, but it provides a much more um, kind of dynamic, very easy to do, not a whole lot of overhead. Uh, in fact, I tend to use it as like a sign-in sheet for my classes, um, kind of have a little to-do, a little checkbox stuck in for each day of the class. The students come in and they just check themselves off and you can use that as well. Yeah, and, that's uh, uh, the, sorry, go the, the, the no, go ahead. thing I'll mention is what's great about this compared to the Kanban view is you can export just this notes view separately as a PDF. So if you wanted to like send it out to folks that maybe aren't using Miro after, it's it exports really cleanly. Perfect. Yeah, and um, this is a funny element of Miro, and a lot of seasoned users run into this, where I get good at using so many methods that when something newer, like the note functionality comes up, I know it's there, and I have to train myself to do it better. So now 
Kieran, you, you've done a great service for the community and a disservice for yourself because now I'm going to hit you up to run me through notes at some point in time. Uh, thank you for that. That's great. Hey, hey John, this, this is Mamlin. There, there, do you mind if I add one detail about the, the Kanban boards uh, for, for Mike? One yeah, of please. the things is, is that with the new capability that um, Miro has for the uh, unnamed users so that they're not added, one of the limitations, I use the Kanban board a lot and like for to-dos, Mike, I will, you can create different swim lanes. So there can be a different swim lane for each person or a project, blah, blah, blah. But those tags that John was showing you, um, if you're using people um, that aren't a, um, a signed in user for the board, so they're an anonymous user, which is that new, uh, relatively new feature, you could use a tag to add their name. That's what I've been doing when I've been using that. And then the other thing that's great about those tags is, is you can color code them. So then you can add another visual layer of, you know, making, you know, Natalie's green and Brittany's blue and Madeline's orange or whatever so that, and then if you put a frame around it, then you can export it as an image. And it's, Correct. it's, it's really nice and, Anyway, I just wanted to mention that about that new capability um, that you can't type in somebody's name if they're not a user or on your team or whatnot. Sorry if I yeah. rattled no, on. That's, that's perfect, Madeline. That's, that's the kind of additional information that we find great. And I'm slightly disappointed you didn't sing it to us, but that's okay. <laughs> you, you, the guitar is for show. I get it. Um, so, Mike, I hope that answers your question or at least gets you pointed in the right direction. There's a lot of information there, obviously, to synthesize, but... Um, it's one useful way to go. Are people using Miro for training? Um, I know someone who's really great at this and her name's Martina. Um, she's she tried to get her before. She might have her audio uh, issues fixed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm here. If you can hear me okay now, it Absolutely. should be all right. Yeah. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, thank you for showing my board earlier. Uh, the basic concept for us is to always think about the experience that people are, are getting when we are having trainings or workshops in office and how do we do it online. So just think about what you would usually do and then try to implement it in Miro. Miro is re really a perfect tool because you are able to put uh, visuals uh, auditive um, video materials so you are really able to target your audience well and um, what you do need to know is that you will need a lot more preparation than for an in-office training for a live training which means that uh, my advice for you is to really structure your training on your board uh, to the to the details so everything that you can do beforehand put it on the board and make it interactive. So um, we actually were able to do sets of, uh, recently, like two weeks ago, we did sets of um, workshops for our, um, for our employees uh, that they were able to go through by themselves. So they, uh, they didn't need any moderator for it. They only needed to follow instructions on the board and then fill in the blanks, so to say it. So really think about how to engage your audience and how to make it interactive because you are able to just give them the link to the board and, uh, and they are able to solve some sort of uh, mini tasks or um, icebreaker uh, activities by themselves and they really then feel more engaged uh, on the board. And of course, uh, for any like real advices like uh, or just to talk about it uh, hit me up on linkedin i left my linkedin uh, up on the icebreaker uh, post so we can talk further about it yeah and of course on the community too so um whoever it was that asked that question i've pasted the link directly to martina's post um where she has all the great examples and um there's a lot of inspiration there it's it's not like there's a an, an easy way to set up a training board but taking you know what you can learn from martina and and applying your own kind of personal flavor it's one of the reasons miro ends up being so great so hopefully that answers 
Uh, I just wonder if I could maybe add a couple of tips um, that I've gone through myself going through a bunch of classes over the last month. One thing I'd recommend is um, have a combination of a class board and an instructor board. Uh, it'll make it really easy. Like if you want to drop solutions in at the end of an exercise, if you have a separate instructor board, you can copy and paste it over, set them all up as individual frames so that that way, if you kind of have built out your class board chronologically as you're going through the class, at the end of the course, you could do your export to PDF. All of the frames will come out in a great little workbook for your students. And if you have your instructor board with each of the solutions as frames, you drop them in, you can move them in the table of contents of the frames and have like a great kind of close out workbook for your file for your students. Yeah, that, that's, that's such an amazing piece of advice. You always want to be keeping like a, a master board of everything that you've got so you can easily adapt it, get it over to new areas. I often set up, and, and another really cool part of it is when I'm doing more uh, process improvement projects, um, you can set up a framework for folks instead of having to teach them everything, you just say, here's an outline of a, a flow chart. Here's an outline of a, a simple process map. You fill it in. And then all of a sudden, I don't have to be the only person in the room who's updating it. I can now guide them and get the discussion going. And then after you work with one group, you take the framework, you copy and paste for the second group. They have exactly the same layout. You take what works, you move it forward, and, and off you go. It's so easy just to control C, control V for entire boards of content, which is amazing. Okay. Um, what are some of the most useful apps to use in Miro? Well, there's a plethora. Um, Miro is integrating with like everything these days. So if I open up here, I have some of my favorites already selected. I love the icon finder. It's a great way to add a little personality and flair to a board. Um, I usually have an introduction section when I'm working with a new group of people um, and I give them each a little private space where they can upload pictures of themselves and family, tell a story, do whatever they want to do. Um, and as you're going through workshops, it's really cool to throw icons up every once in a while just to give a little bit of flavor. Google image search works really well. We have integrations with, with, with Jira, um, Google Drive, Dropbox. I'll just pop open the page here. It's hard for me to say what my favorites are because I use them for my own specific purpose, but um, I'm sure that folks will find something that works for them. The voting plugin is, is a pretty essential one to have. The timer is a pretty essential one to have. Keep everybody on task um, to what they're doing. Integration with Microsoft Teams, Google Drive. Um, I'll slowly scroll down here, but you'll soon get the idea that it's it's pretty endless and there's more being added all the time. So this would be a great discussion to raise on the community boards to have people not only talk about what their favorite app integration is, but how they use it and how they get some benefit from it. Uh, and then we can all kind of learn from that experience and, and get better at what we all do. Um, now it's integrating with Gmail. I don't even know what that'll do. So cool. I'm going to learn though. That's, that's what I'm getting in here for. Chrome extensions. Yeah. So it's literally endless. That's a really big question that you asked. Um, if you have some specific uses that you want to learn about, maybe the community could come up with the apps that would maybe best suit that purpose for you. So hopefully that's not too much of a cop-out answer, but um, I, I hope that whoever asked the question knows that there's just a ton out there of apps that we can use. Can we get some value stream map shapes in the Miro toolbar? Interesting. There are general shapes over in the Miro toolbar for sure. If you select um, the shape um, part, it looks like a square. Um, there's a couple of simple shapes in here. There's nothing quite like value stream mapping shapes, although I'm sure you could include some together. Um, there is value stream mapping as a template. I'm just going to go over to an open area of the board, open up my templates. We can just search for value. And here's a value chain. Um, it, it's a little bit different than some of the value stream mapping I've done, um, but the, the basics are here. Likely what you would end up doing is building a template uh, based on everything that you have available to you and, and saving it in your template list. And then when you do that, you let me know because I wanna steal it. I've been thinking about it. I've, I've done a few similar complicated templates that fit my purpose and I'll share them with the board if you ever wanna look at some the, the ramblings of a crazy person. Um, so that's about as far as we have. So can we get those shapes added? Uh, I'm not sure there's a plan for that in the near future. Um, as you can tell, there's so many different ways of using Miro. Uh, the value stream mapping may not be a priority for now, but like I said, we are the community. We get to decide a lot of where we go and, and um, we could potentially have a collaborative event or some kind of a design sprint to, to come up with a value stream map. That would be a fun event. Um, maybe have a competition to see who could come up with the best one. Uh, everybody likes a little bit of competition. 
So that was that question hopefully answered fairly well. Um, let's get that one orange. The next one I saw here is how do you get to the community? Well, number one is you can click this link here um, to go to Martina's particular post. The link is simple, community.miro.com. Go there, sign up um, and get involved. We're actually really interested to see if we get a good influx of users into the community following this event. And please tell all your friends because the more people in the community, the better it's going to be for us all. Um, the other um, link to know is events.miro.com. Um, okay, Nick asked a question. We are trying to find the best ways to manage users for training courses that last for three days. Um, that's great. Um, so how can we help with that? Um, so I can, manage I, can, I can offer something to that, Jonathan, because most of our right. courses are three-day courses. Um, so we, the first time or the first few weeks when we were using Miro, we were using the day passes. We were on a consultant plan. We were using the day passes. But the other option that you've got is if you're doing like multiple courses over the, the space of a month, what you can do is you can just kind of add full user licenses. Um, you're charged kind of month to month. And you can kind of move around the license from in terms of who the named user is, right? So if you've got, unless you've got a whole bunch of courses happening at the same time, if they're sort of like back to back, you can kind of like give the license to the learners in one course and then kind of take it away from them and give it to another and so on, that kind of a thing. And that's the approach that we've used. It works out to be cheaper than going with the day passes. Right? Yeah, I've had the same experience too. Day passes have just you know, you, you run into an explosion of people logging in and you end up paying way more than what the monthly thing would be. Managing the users on the back end once you have the seats created for those consulting plans and switching people around, it, it's a little bit tricky, but not impossible. And once you get good at it, um, you're off and running. So, um, you know, the more experience we have with, with what people are, are needing to use Miro for, I'm sure that Miro will listen and, and figure out ways to help us manage our users a little bit more effectively. And mm -hmm. certainly now, uh, and I'm not sure how long it's going to be left open, but the, um, the anonymous contributions really open up a lot of interesting possibilities to just, because I'm seeing, you know, we've given a blanket link for this, for this page and users that are logging in, um, if they have their own Miro accounts, their names actually pop up. So you can still tell who's doing what. And for people who don't have an account, they come up as anonymous, which is totally fine too. Um, so there's a couple of different ways with success people are, are right. getting. Is, is that ringing true for you, Nick? Uh, kind of. So that's been the experience we've had as well. And we are flexing the, uh, the monthly subscription numbers. Um, I guess one of what I was curious about was if there was a way to have essentially a temporary account that had slightly less access rights. They couldn't create their own boards. They couldn't do anything other than just use the boards we provided, the, sort of a sandbox view. Um, still with the full Miro access, but within the uh, the training boards that we provide as part of that right. experience. I know when you set up boards, you can say, can everyone in my company um, at least see the boards, even if they can't access them. You can start to turn some of those features off so that when mm -hmm. users log in, they only see the board that they've been given access to. Yep. Um, but I think, you know, we're kind of feeling some of your pain and have, have had some workarounds that have worked well. Yep. Um, and so let's, like I said, let's continue this discussion. Let, let's make the, the, the issues that we're having known to Miro and, and see what they can do with it. Because they're rich mm -hmm. now. They got money <laughs> to fix this problem. <laughs> um, Thanks, that's guys. great. Absolutely. Um, real sketching directly in Miro would be great, Adrian. Well, a little bit would be great. There is this um, free draw pen tool. Um, you can adjust thickness here and then start to draw a couple of circles. I've used this before with, um, I have a, a tablet or sorry, a, um, a laptop that has a, a, a touch screen and it comes with a pen for it. I've actually drawn in Miro decently well but as you can tell by my horrible circles here it's not that easy especially with the mouse and um, I have worked with some other um, colleagues who end up drawing freehand in another program and then importing the drawing into Miro so um, I think yeah some some additional sketching if, if that was indeed the intent of your question uh, Adrian uh, it is possible and um, it, it's not amazing compared to some of the other uh, applications that can do it a little bit better, but at least there is the ability to do some free drawing and some free sketching. Uh, Apple Pencil, oh, look, so people have already stuck in sticky notes here. I love you guys, this is so good. And this kind of workspace here, uh, which I'll expand over a little bit. If it's on a yellow sticky, we will answer it and, um, and make sure that we get back to you. Um, the other area is um, we have a retrospective at the bottom of the page set up. So, 
um, being the awesome community that we are, what we wanted to know was, um, is there anything right now that you need from the Miro community? Anything you want to get out of the community experience? So you can grab a sticky and you can throw it into the need column. Um, if on the other hand that you feel that you um, are a Miro expert and you have some uh, subject matter expertise or some direction or cool ideas or tips and tricks, is there anything you think you could contribute to the Miro community because maybe people don't know they need what you've got until you tell us that you have it. And then finally, um, are there any specific topics that you would want to see in the future, either covered at an event or maybe we could start to generate some conversation in the Miro community to try and get you some answers around some of the issues that you might be having. Um, so please take some time. You can start now or you can go um, later on, come back over the course of the week to take some time to reflect. And we also just wanted to know um, if you're a member of the Miro community or not. So this is a simple dot dragging exercise. Just drag it over. I am a member myself. So boom, look how nicely coordinated these are too. Did someone line those up? Mm -hmm. You guys, you guys, that's great. So if you're uh, thinking about joining the Miro community, Events like today are more like what we do um, once a month in the North American ones. But like we said, we would like to have more because these events are recorded and posted. You can always go back and view some of the older events, um, which I highly recommend you do. There have been some fantastic topics on, on user design, on using qualitative data um, in Miro and, and summarizing it. It's just some fantastic stuff, great functionality. And down at the very bottom of our page at the end, we have the direct links to the Miro community and to the events page. You can just click the little icons here to jump right there, sign up and make sure you're getting notified when there's new and amazing things happening in Miro, which appears to be daily. Mm -hmm.